Quand des gens strike et dans tes bouchettes Et avec des lunettes qui font peur La victoire est signée Des mots heureux Hey, welcome to Game Over, the baseball podcast, animated by my big, uh, my good friend Eric Gagne and myself, Max Martin. They still say Max and Martin in English, but I want to be like, you know, if I say just Max Martin, it makes it sound so international, man. Doesn't Very it? official. Very official. <laughs> exactly. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> good. How you doing? How's everything? Uh, good, man. I mean, I, we, we didn't almost lost you, but you, uh, you, you, you took quite the uh, butt, uh, the mud bath, right? You were yeah, Burning I mean, Man. Yeah, the Burning, Burning Man, Man thing. Uh huh. That was amazing. That was that was really cool. That's my second year. This year was the first time that, that I <laughs> I didn't know there was supposed to be mud there. I mean, it's in literally in a in, it's in an old bed, like an old lake bed, and yeah. it's supposed to be dried out. It's amazing. It's a very self sustained city that they're building. It's about eighty thousand people. So we went up there, and then uh, me and a bunch of friends, and basically just live on your own. You're trying to, it's, it's like a community. You're just trying to help each other out. There's no money exchange. There's no nothing. So you got to figure really? out the, oh, everything. It's very, very tough, but it's, it's fun. Cause it's, did you uh, use your body to get some extra water? That's all I'm asking. Did you have course, to, uh... of course I did. I had to, uh, <laughs> I did do things that we can't talk about on this show. Actually we can, we can do whatever we want. That's right. No, but actually, <laughs> no, but you come a couple of times and it was actually, it sounded like really cool. Like this whole community. Yeah. Uh, feel of like, especially, you know, the, uh, the, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the, what was that was what was what I'm looking for the uh, leaving the the site got delayed of course by the by the mudslides and stuff so so you guys like like to squeeze it and actually like you just said like you know go see other people and try to get some you know I'll trade you vodka for some meat and stuff <laughs> we've done a lot of that yes it, it was yeah. fun it was a lot of fun because basically you're just going in there you got to take care of your own housing get to take care of your own food your own water everything else and it's very you know it's very humbling but there's so many cool things. It's not a music festival. It's not that it's literally a self-sustainable uh, way of living. You're trying to yeah. help each other out. And there's amazing music. There's a many DJs as art. It's more like an art, art yeah. uh, festival, I will call it. But How big is the burning man? Cause I mean, you have to leave before, uh, actually the funny thing is you said you've been there twice and you never, you never saw the burning of the man. Not yet, no, because last year we had basically a uh, we had a storm, a, you know, a sandstorm there for okay. about 48 hours. That was very, very difficult. And uh, we had no air conditioning for a long time. It was brutal. It was really hot. And then so we left a little early because you got to remember, there's 80,000 people trying to yep. live in one lane and it's very difficult. Yeah. So or what we, we call here in Montreal a Tuesday morning. But that's a different <laughs> yeah, subject. Exactly. But, but I mean, by being in a desert full of, you know, there's no shower. There's no nothing, really. You're just literally trying to survive. But it's beautiful. The com- Like you talked about, the community is amazing. Yeah. The way they do it, just the way they put it together. I mean, if you guys want to go online and everything else, it's really cool how they do it. There's so many cool pictures, but you got to work hard for those pictures. They're not just, uh, it's like they say, it's not just a plug and play fun thing. It's very literally, you got to build. You got to yeah, feel some gotta, misery. You got to yeah, earn that pleasure. You got to earn it, everything. Right, so it's very, very year, humbling. Maybe next year. It's a really good reset button, I'd say. You know, yeah. you kind of you detach from everything and really makes you appreciate the little things in life, and it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I had the same kind of vacation, actually. I went out, uh, I improvised the trip. Uh, I, I was Someone gave me a, a van life, a sprinter, whatever you want, you want to call it. Mm-hmm. A Dodge Ram tandem is what it's called. First time I went, uh, I've, I've been I've been dying to do this for a while. It seems to be the thing to do when you're 50 now is going like on a van life trip, you know, improvise, take pictures of a sunset, and you know, meditate by the sunrise and stuff. And anyway, and I took the dog with me, uh, who uh, actually got sprayed by a skunk, which is actually, and, and we got away with it. It was just like a small, little small spray. And then, like you said, like the whole community thing. No, it's funny because everybody around me kind of like you know, everybody had their like their own remedy. So we had like this homemade soap, and it actually worked. But anyway, so I went to see a couple of ball games. I went to uh, Portland to see the Sea Dogs, which mm-hmm. is the double A for uh, for the Red Sox. They've actually reproduced the Green Monster, which is really cool. And I'm sitting in the stands, and I'm sitting in a section where like a lot of people are walking by, and I'm one of those rare people that when I go to a game, I watch the fucking game. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like everybody's just walking around. You're like, get your food, get the, get all of it. Just sit down. I'm trying to watch the game. Stop wandering around and just like take no, just fucking watch the game. Anyway, that was my editorial. Thank you. And um, so I'm sitting like in the last row of the first section between first and uh, and uh, home plate and first. And 
and I let go of the leash for a second. And for those who are wondering, my, I carry my dog everywhere because it's a service dog. She's a service dog for me. I got ADHD. Obviously, and... you guys can tell he needs a dog next Exactly. To him. <laughs> Actually, I need a herd is what I need, man. It's like, <laughs> but anyway, I just let go of the leash for a second, man. There's, there's, a, there's a single between uh, just like that's uh, rolled by the pitcher out of reach for the, uh, for the shortstop. And she, as soon as, soon as, as of the crack of the bat, she starts running down the stairs, barking, rah, 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 and just chasing, man, the ball. And if it wasn't for the net, she was going on the field, man. So now the whole, everybody in the stadium is laughing, and I'm calling her back. Her name is Aura, for those who are taking notes, scoring a game at home. And uh, <laughs> as she's coming back, the whole place is just erupting in those. They were clapping. I, it either was like, way to go, idiot, or uh, thanks for the entertainment. I, I, I'm, I'm going to leave the second. I'm going to go for the second. But uh, but I, I, here's a little moment of therapy, and I'm sure before we have our guest, because today I'm pretty excited. We get Jeff Facero, man. Anybody who's, whoever was an expo to me has, has got a place in my heart and stuff. And um, so before we have Jeff, I'm sure he's going to appreciate that. During my trip, I met this great girl, and uh, well, and uh, she, she, she lives she, she doesn't live in Montreal. I'll try to give as little details as possible. Anyway, so uh, and she's supposed to be and she's supposed to be going for business to Toronto. I was like, oh man, the Jays are in town. I'll uh, I'll I'll meet up with you. You know, I'll take the train. I'll get a chance to ride in the train and stuff. I call Russell, Russell Martin, and goes, man, you still have connections, obviously, with the office because all the good tickets were gone. So I said, do you think you can find me some good tickets? He goes, yeah, no problem. And writes to the uh, traveling secretary. Everything's set up. The day before I'm supposed to leave, her sugar daddy calls me. It isn't, he writes to me this fucking distort, distorted message of like, you know, uh, I, I know you've met whatever her name is. She's a great girl, but, you know, we've been together for a while. And then I, I like you to really know brother the brother. Yeah, brother the brother, you fucking piece of shit. I, you know, we're trying to like, he goes, uh, you know, I'd like you, if you respect the relationship. And I, I know you're off to France to, to, to go on tour for a month and we'll take care of your dog. And the guy's married. The guy's on, on top of it. Well, any good sugar daddy is going to be married. At least he's, he's respecting, you know, the whole... Did he, did he offer you something to back off or what? Oh, no. You think I should have asked <laughs> or something? Because I'm probably not used to it. Anyway, so I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote back a message. I, don't, I, I, don't, I call them stuff I can't really say here. I know we say everywhere. We say everything, but uh, fuck face came up a few times. I said, man, don't you ever fucking write to me again. The thing is, like, I, I, here's was debate. I was like, should I write to his wife? I should send a message to his wife. She deserves to know. But anyway, so, uh, yeah. But you know what I'm more upset about? I'm not losing the girl. I didn't go to see the game, man. I wanted to see the Blue Jays game. It was against the Rangers. Because uh, right now, I don't, I don't when you guys are watching the podcast, but right now it's September 14th. They've lost, uh, is it three in a row, I think, to the Rangers? I'm like, what the hell is going on? Let's, this is my segue. Let's go from, from being fucked around by a girl and her, and, her, and, her, and, her, and her sugar daddy to actually talking about important things. Man, I thought the Rangers were done. I thought the Rangers were done. They were, like, playing crap. Ever since they made all those big moves at the trade deadline, they were playing like crap. I have no idea why. Scherzer was a it was the exact same guy he was in New York. You know, I I thought maybe a new place would you know rejuvenate, you know, maybe a bit to get some juice, extra juice in that arm. And now he's hurt, he's not coming back for sure. Uh what the hell's going on with that team, man? Oh well, you know, we talked about it earlier. I mean, the, you know, the trade deadlines are always great. It's always good for the fans. It's always uh there's always a uh, hope behind those and a lot of it is a lot of the times it's more of a pick me up for the players that okay they're like okay we know that the front office was behind us and everything else but it doesn't always work out i'm one of the prime example of that but it's you know it's hard. are you gonna it's go with the boston thing, thing again you're gonna bring back the boston no thing, i'm not even right? going there see you gotta bring it back <laughs> <laughs> but no i think it's not that easy i mean they're, they're going different cities but a scherzer i think scherzer was doing fine i mean the injury just gonna hurt that really bad because he's a guy yeah. that Hopefully it's just something that doesn't sound like it's nothing, but it sounds like it's going to be pretty much the whole year done. But when you're 40 years old, it's never a small thing. Yeah, it's a marathon. That's why we play 162. I mean, guys yeah. get really excited about, you know, halfway through. They're like, okay, we got a chance and everything else. But I think that's the, that's the fun part about the new playoff formats. I think a lot of teams think they have a chance, and that really keeps all the fans involved. And you brought out something really interesting about the playoffs and the race and everything else and the division play that you'd like to see a little more. Yeah, like, we talked on the phone like, last night. Yeah, exactly. I was, we were talking when I called you last night. Um, I, th I think uh, who was playing San Francisco was like, on, was, it this, was it the Mariners? Anyway, I'm thinking like there shouldn't be any in, uh, interleague play as of like, I don't know, mid-August or something. I mean, 
back in the good old days, man, and it, it, September was all interdivision games, and that's all it was all about, man. I want to see the American League West play against each other, even with teams like Oakland were out and uh, and uh, oh Rockies against the Giants. But before that, uh, the, like three days before, someone just popped up something. But there was Ameri- there was American League team playing in San Francisco, and I was like, why, really? There's, you know, I mean, the Giants are like, you know, are still battling for uh, for wild card spot. How come they're not playing Cincinnati? I know it's in the yeah. same, it's not the same, uh, it's on the same division, but at least it's in the same league, you know. I mean, I, I, I just don't get it, and I, 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 I forget when they made the change, but there used to be a time where, as of like, you know, late August or early September, forget playing against like, you know, this this unrelevant team, man. I want to see. Yeah, Inter- Inter- see- interdivision play, especially in the National League Central, American League West, uh, even National League just- East. Yeah, and then especially if you're trying to create some, uh, you know, rivalries, I think that kind of it is the time to do it. You know, rivals in the inter league, not inter league, but uh, inter inter division rivals. I think you know, play see the Yankees and the Red Sox back in the days when I was there. I mean, that's what the fans want to see. I think I like the inter division, uh, inter league play, but I think earlier in the season would be kind of nice. Yeah, but, June, but, July, uh, you know, it's fun for the tourist. You can follow your yep. team to a city you've never been. You know, it makes it interesting, it makes it different. But in August and September, there's no nah, there's no room for that. Yeah. My yeah, point. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I want to talk before we bring <laughs> Jeff. Um, there's been like um, major stories that uh, we, we can talk about them, but we, we don't have all the details yet. I'm talking about like Wander Franco in Tampa Bay and then uh, Julio Arias in, in, with the Dodgers. When something yeah. this big happens, that's like you know off field related. Yeah, that's. Uh... Let, let me, I'm gonna ask you. It's, it's a two part question. By the time we find out. You guys already know. You guys have had doubts for a while, right? Have you ever walked into like a, a, a dressing room and go, "Really, that happened?" Or mostly, you know, but obviously, you guys aren't gonna tell because, I mean, you know, who's gonna be? Uh, well, I mean, um, like just like drug testing or something. They, a lot of times, they know about it earlier and they're notified. They're like the, the team, the players would know, and then notify probably the team in the league, and then depending on what kind of. Uh, punishment it should be but in that and i think in those cases especially when you talk about domestic violence it's very 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 touchy because you want to keep the privacy yeah. you want to make sure that you want to make sure that the player gets this true like like the due diligence and you know the real story out there so that's why it's a little touchy but it's going to be very interesting to see because it's you know no matter what happens it's a lose 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 situation for all parties I but mean, how does it affect the because i don't you know I, look this is only my own affects. personal opinion i don't think franco is that popular in that dressing room that in that well, locker room that that's my hard. point of view i'm not sure but i mean i'm not, i don't know if he's popular or not but what i can tell you when you have drama like this happening in a team where you're trying to win ball games you don't want that that's not something no. that players invite they don't and that's not something they're looking for it's something you want to just put your head down you want to go go work you want to go win some ball games you want to do everything in your power to yeah. get to that of course these are private matters this is very difficult to kind of comment on it but i think you know, it's going to be interesting how the league and how the teams and how the players react to this because, I mean, the players are going to have something to do with this. I don't know if it's the first time or not. I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to even go into the second time. Happened. Second time. So it's going to be touchy. He's a free agent next year. Yeah. I mean, we all know, like, the we all know how delicate it is because, you know, you don't want to alienate your base, your, your, your fan base, which is, you know, 50% of your fan base is women. So you don't want to do that. This is very important that the league gets it right, the team gets it right, and the player understand what's at stake. Yeah. And I think – Hopefully, people see that. We're talking about the Bauer situation. Uh, that's going to be very, very, very interesting to see how that all unfolds. Because remember, Osuna it's with the It's not over, man. I mean, yeah, but I mean, Bauer is not coming back. He... I don't know. I mean, I, I don't Ozuna, know. Osuna, I'm you know, surprised. It's hard, it's hard for me to really comment on it because you're trying to keep it private. It's hard to, like... It's hard to know because it's very difficult because you got a you got a brand to protect. MLB has a brand to protect. The teams have a brand to protect, and hopefully the players see it that way. That's yeah. their their brand as well. So hopefully players see that hey, you have to protect your own brand. You have to make sure that you maximize your value, and you know the way to do it is you know through yeah. understanding what your 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 job is and what your responsibilities are towards the league, towards the team, and towards your teammate. And I think it's very important that. You know, you, you got to have a due process for those guys right now. I mean, it's it's very hard not to judge. It's very hard to say, you know, you know, uh, you know, fuck that. It's over. No, don't. But I think he is. He has the right to due process. It's going to be very interesting to see because you saw ba- Bauer getting basically getting banned from baseball almost. I yeah, mean, even, though, even, even baseball, though they were like, yeah. 
I don't know the old details. I'm not going to go again to details, but it's touchy. It's a bad situation <laughs> for baseball. It's a bad situation for Come the Dodgers. Give me something. Again, Come the on, Dodgers. Gags. Again. Come on, give me something. I'm not going to because I'm like, juicy you know, I feel, I feel for his wife. I feel for his, the player. I feel for the teams that trust the players into their brand. The same thing with the league. I mean, it's it's touchy. And what I what I can say is. When I was playing, when I was a rookie coming up, they used to do those. I, I went to Washington, so all the prospects, not all the big prospects, most prospects would have to go through basically a, almost like a life, a baseball life, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, seminar. You go out there, you meet people about the gambling. Like we met some guys that used to be in the mafia, kind of what they're going really? to do with you. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, oh, they, 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 they would give you classes on that one or how to manage your money, all that stuff. I don't know if they still do that. But I think as a brand, I think I would restart that because you need sensitivity courses. You need all those things that because a lot of guys, you know, you know, you're coming up and you're a big star. You think, you know, you think it's, you know, you're untouchable, but you're not. You're normal. It's a, and it's very important for them to sense, make, make sure sensitivity course for those guys. So hey, you're coming up, you're you're a target. Not a, I don't want to say you're a target, but you're you're going to be put on the platform that you have responsibilities that come with. Yeah. And that's and when you sign, you, you sign your line on the dots and you say, you know, Eric Gagne, I play for the Dodgers. I'm a major league baseball player. That comes with responsibilities. You know, I messed up. I've done it before. I've made mistakes and I wish I could take it back, but you know, it's hard. It's very hard. It's going to be a very, it's a sad situation for MLB. It's a sad situation for the Dodgers and especially for their his family. Yeah. So hopefully, Hopefully they can come up with something that makes sense, but it's going to be interesting to see, especially with the Bauer situation, how, how hard to come down on him. And Ozuna, we haven't seen Ozuna since either. I mean, he, Ozuna, I think he yeah, he's, he's with Atlanta, with Jays, right? And then, is he? Yeah, yeah, he's having, actually, he's having a decent season. The closer? No, I'm talking about the outfielder. Oh, wow, I was talking about the closer, remember? Was, oh, oh God, yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, we got, we got confused. <laughs> hey, really quickly, because we got somebody waiting that I can't wait to talk to. Um, because I, I don't want to end on this like sad, dark note, but uh, I saw something this week that was just so heartwarming. It was Mookie Betts warming up with a fan in between the innings? He was just tossing the ball with this young kid in the stands, man. God, I would have given anything to be that kid, man. It was just so beautiful. I should have sent the video to Simon. I'm sorry. If you find it, Simon, let us know. Maybe we'll show it at the end. But uh, God, it was beautiful. Just, you know, between inning tossing and stuff and just like the kid's like 12, 13, whatever. It's like, you know, probably living the moment of his life, you know. Once you've done that, actually, actually, it's kind of sad because once you've done that, everything's downhill from there. <laughs> now, yeah, you say, every time you go into the ball game, I'm gonna play catch with Mookie Betts. Exactly. But just imagine, just imagine the stories he's gonna have going back to school, and that's really cool. I think that's where like these are superstars like that, and you know, get the fans involved. It's really cool, and he's gonna have so many good stories. It's probably gonna be the best time of his, you know, the, the highlight of his yeah. life so far for sure. It is, but it's gonna be amazing stories. It's, it's almost a highlight of my life stories. watching the video. If I can imagine <laughs> just living in and stuff, but you know what? I mean, it's not that I was indifferent to Mookie Betts. I mean, I I, I think he's a great player. Um, you know, when he got traded from Boston to LA, I was still waiting for him to have uh, to, to have this huge big season. <laughs> This year is the one, you know, but on top of it, I'm becoming a fan good. of the guy. He's man. always that good. So you got to love him because he plays in the West. You don't look at him. You think about you, Jays, you're Baltimore. And, you know, he's a stud. He's, a, he's one of those guys that he's, yeah. he's done he's done really well on the field. We all know that. He's a Hall of Fame type career. But, I mean, off the field. Really, Hall of Fame? Okay. Well, that's pretty good. We'll he will see. be. I think he will be. I mean, yeah. he's got a long ways to go anyway. So he's got time. Hey, let's bring our guest, man, to tell because, uh, and I know exactly what the first, the first question I'm going to ask. That's going to involve both of you. So, uh, without uh, wasting any time, this is Jeff Fisero. Podcast for a while, so I was like, I thought it was play ball when it was game on. Jeff Fisero, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. Good. Doing good. Just relaxing, you know. Yeah. Living the dream, I guess, right now. Well, <laughs> living the dream, of course. Every time, every time I talk to guests, well, not every time, but more and more often than not, you guys are playing golf together, you know, just to hang it out and stuff. It's like I feel like everybody's in Phoenix except me. I'm just trying to make. I'm, I'm waiting for this podcast to become big to make the move and just uh, join it. I won't play golf with you guys because uh, I'll waste your time. But I mean, uh, I've been to Gags' uh, place. I, I can I can understand why you guys just hauling out there. I mean, this is, you know, where you want to be and stuff. I'm going to ask you a question, and that's for both of you. Uh, like I said, I mean, this is, uh, we're right now September 14th. Uh, you guys have been involved with the, you know, in pennant races, won some of them and stuff. How exciting is this time of the year when you're a ball player? And don't tell me you don't look up at the scoreboard. Come on. 
Yeah, if you're if you're in the hunt, you're always looking at the scoreboard. You want to see where you're at, where you're standing. I mean, you look at the Braves last night, clinched already. Yeah. They don't have to look at the score. They don't have to look the scoreboard the rest here. But with the wild card stuff nowadays, there's at least six, seven teams that are looking at the scoreboard every night in each division. Mm-hmm. Well, not back because back in the days it'd be like what only like I mean well, back back when you mm-hmm. when, when you broke into the league there were still four divisions right two in each league right if I'm correct yeah. yes you think two it was more league. League. that was a long long time a... ago sorry Jeff you know yeah, I had to go a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> uh, do you think it was so better yeah. do you think it was better with those four divisions or what we have now six divisions per league I mean there's more teams obviously so it's a... there's more teams uh, I like the expanded playoffs I like the uh, Having that, it keeps teams, it keeps fans interested in the game longer. I mean, you know, if you think about it, you look at some of these divisions, there's teams that were out of the playoffs. Day like two. Oakland, Kansas, <laughs> Oakland, Kansas City before they left spring training. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's no fan interest. But at least with the uh, expanded playoffs and stuff like that, the interest is always going to be there now. But, you know, listening to you guys earlier and talking about the interleague play, I'm hundred percent with you guys. I think interleague play should be played like it was meant to be played. The West plays the West, the central plays the central and the East plays the East. And you do it one time a year and you win your division, playing your division, not playing out of division. Especially not this time of year. No, not yeah. what's crunch time. Come on, you know? Yeah. I think they need to add two more. They need to add two more teams so they can go, Make both teams six, both leagues sixteen, and they don't have to worry about playing in a league play every. Yeah. At least in the series. Well, we know which one, uh, which, uh, which, which, one of those we'd like to see here. But uh, God, you know, how many times have we talked about it this year? And, and you know, I mean, I was hoping that you know, the more we'd get into it, the more we talk to people like you, and then and we had Larry Walker, and we had like Perry Jean, we had a bunch of guys, and just like you know, I'm hoping for hope to rise somewhere, but I don't know. <laughs> I hey, Jeff, don't know. How many years? How many years have been in the, uh, in the playoffs? So uh, you've been 16 years in the big leagues. How many years in the playoffs? Uh, three times. Three times. Once no, with the no, Rangers, also... once with the Mariners, and once with the Cardinals. Yeah, that's amazing. The World that's Series. What, yeah, that's what I was telling people. Like how crazy it is. There's guys I play with. Uh, a bunch of guys play 20 <clears> years, uh, and they don't even get to the playoffs or get the World Series. So I was lucky enough. But what you, what do you think makes a difference? I mean, we know like. We all know about pitching and everything else, but the big difference, I think, this year, you got, you got the Braves already clinched. You know they're really, really good, but when these guys getting in the playoffs, who do you think has got the biggest advantage? The guys are coming in coming in hot just barely because we talked about when, uh, I think, Colorado won in 07, we won the World Series with, the, uh, with Boston. They came in, and they just basically literally came in super hot. You think guys that clinch early have a bigger advantage, just the rest, or you think the guys that are coming in hot with good momentum into the playoffs have a better chance? You know, you talk about that. Uh, I was talking with uh, one of my boys last night about the Rockies and what, cause we were watching the Braves game and we were talking about clinching so early. And when you look at the Rockies, they swept through everything and they had like eight days off before they had to play Boston. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's a cooling factor. So I think you still need to be playing. Um, you know, I, I mean, they got a lot of time. They can they can rest guys, but guys still have to play for Atlanta. I think it's better if you clinch a little later, um, just so you have that intensity to keep up. You know, you played this game, Eric. It's not easy yeah. to turn it on and off. You know, it's exactly. it's got to be there constantly. Yeah. Really, honestly, I mean, I, as a fan, I keep hearing that too. Also, but I'm thinking, like, a four day off could make that much of a difference. I mean, obviously, you know. Practice doesn't make up for it, but I mean, how can how can teams fill up? Is it like intra squad game or whatever? Or I don't know. Bring up your triple A team and you know have a couple guys, you know, a couple of innings of uh, of play. But honestly, a couple of days off can make that much difference. Yeah, it can. I mean, it just I I think you lose some intensity there, and you get a little relaxation, and uh, all of a sudden it's like, okay, now I got to try and turn it back on, and if it doesn't go, then you're I think you're in trouble. 
Yeah. I mean, baseball's all momentum and we all know. And the crazy thing is, you know, especially now me and Jeff always had that conversation, you know, Jeff, I call, I'll call you old school if you don't mind, you know, old school okay. and everything else. And of course, Max is going to think, I always say data, 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 but anyway, you're going back to the data and, thing now. You're going to data analytics. Right I'm going to go, okay. I'm going to use it for analytics world, you know, and you know, we all know what, you know, how the analytics work during the season. It's a long marathon and everything else, but do you think that get, you know, you have teams get in the playoffs and then they totally change their approach. I mean, now it's totally different ball game. So like, what do you think you should be there? Do you like the new analytics department stuff or do you like how they, cause literally I think they, I feel like they lost a little bit of feel for the game because you have managers that make moves just to make the moves. Cause this is what it's been given to them. So what do you got on a new style of baseball, the new analytics world of baseball? Uh, the new style of baseball, I think, with the uh, clock and all that stuff, it's kind of taking it back to old school. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, if you watch games when I play, when I first came up and when I was playing basically through the early 2000s, games weren't lasting four hours, three hours. We were playing games in two hours and 25, 30 minutes. Um, and I think now that, I think there's a good place for analytics, but I think that they've gone overboard with it during the season. I mean, there's a point where you got to just let the guys play. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you know, analytics for one guy aren't the same for every guy. And I think what's happened with pitching, a lot with pitching, is they try to make everybody exactly the same. Yeah, you know, it's, size... I've seen guys, yeah, one size fits all, basically. You have to be able to throw a forcing fastball up for the analytic people. And there's guys that can't. There's sinker ball pitchers that can't do that. And the teams will make adjustments with that end up having some good pitching. I mean, I looked at, I, mean, I watched the Giants. The Giants have like three sinker ball pitchers on their team, and they that's what they let them do. And mm -hmm. they're guys that are giving them six and seven innings every time they go out there. Yep. And you lose that with some of the analytics. But I think there's a good place for both. But the problem is they don't have enough baseball people in the game right now, I don't think, to yeah, I mean, read the numbers. I think it's a little slick, cyclical because I mean, you know, now it's coming back. We see a lot more sinker ballers coming back. We see now we see the values of evening up innings. I mean, back in the day when, you know, when you go six, seven innings, five, you know, we used to be called five and dive. I mean, that was a negative thing. Five and dive, you go five and you're out, you're there to win and you're looking for an excuse to get out. I mean, they, the taxes your bullpen a lot. And I think now they might not mind as much because they probably have a lot of numbers in the back and they got a lot of guys that can throw one inning. But I think it makes a big difference. But how would you fare yourself, like the way you pitch your sinker baller split and a little slider, and you think you would do – how do you think you would do in today's game, the way they swing the ball and the way they swing the bat compared to what they they used to do? I still think I would do okay because I, I still threw relatively hard with the sinker, and I had pretty decent control. So I think what you see nowadays, these guys that throw hard, their control and command is not good. I would even say I had good command. You know, when you throw 200 innings and you walk 60 guys in a year, that's pretty decent control and command. Yep. Um, but I think, I think, heck, pitching down, I, I still haven't seen any ground ball leave the ballpark. You always have a chance. <laughs> I had. You always have. You always have a chance to get in a double play if a guy's on base with that. It's hard yep. to get double plays with balls going in the air. Yep. And I think you're right. And I think we talked about pace of play. And I think the big difference, everybody's trying to speed up the game. I'm like, what about you throw more strikes in the zone, more contact? And that will speed up the game. I think that's what we've lost a lot. And, you know, guys are start trying to throw swing and misses pitches on OO. I mean, a swing and miss pitch is not worth anything on OO. It's worth something with two strikes, but OO, it's not really valued well. And I think that's been a big difference. But, you know, it's but, pretty you know, from what I watched this year, you know, and, and Jeff, you mentioned it, you know, I'm not that old either, like I'm 54. But, I mean, I, when I was a kid, I just those hit and runs and their bunts and, like, you know, lots of steals and stuff. I, 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 I'm, I'm glad we're seeing some of that again because, I mean, the last couple of years, it, it was always like either strike out or home run. You know, it got to be boring. And, uh, and now it's, it's, it's more, a lot more imaginative. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's the, the game is – swinging back to where they want more action, see more actions. And if you actually look at the teams that are playing well, the teams that are doing that, I mean, look at the Yankees. They're still built for power and stuff like that. And they're, they're a struggling team this year. It's because they don't have anybody that can steal bases on their team, really. And Snowball. they're not putting the ball in play. But you look at, like, 
The Reds are exciting, fast team. Yeah. The Diamondbacks have been an exciting, fast team this year. Seattle. The Cubs are doing the same. Seattle's doing the same thing. I mean, there's, you know, they're they're creating runs. They're not just waiting for somebody to hit one out of the ballpark. I got a question for both of you, actually, because, I mean, recently there was a, the trade was made between the Rangers and the Royals to send Chapman uh, to be a, you know, a co-closer for, for the Texas Rangers. And uh, Carl Raggins. Uh, young kid, I think he's 24 at the most, 23, 24, not even 25, anyway, who's been crushing it ever since uh, he's been called up. Um, he didn't have good ERA, good stats while he was in the uh, Texas Rangers pitching plans. Gets a trade, apparently, you know, was sent down to AAA for, like, you know, a quick stint. And it's been, light, it's been lights out ever since he's been up, uh, ever since he's been recalled by, the, uh, by uh, the, the Royals. Actually, if he had the numbers that he has right now with KC, with Texas, I don't think they would, be, they, they would have claimed maybe that playoff uh, spot too. My question is, what is it, something, like, you know, when you, if you're struggling, if you got an IERA, uh, a team moves you, and, you know, for some reason, the right coach at the right time sees something that nobody else saw. And it's like, without saying it's a quick fix, just that one little precise detail. What's, what's your own experience living? And I'm actually quite, I'm asking the question to both of you. Who made that difference for you? What was the difference? And it's amazing because with all the, 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 and the analytics, like the, uh, Eric always said, and, and the cameras, the studying. I mean, you guys are pitching. There's eight people around you on the mountain examining every twitch of, you know, on your body. But for some reason, some one person would make that difference. You yeah, want to I mean, start or you want me to? Uh... I'll go. I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. The question was very long. I know, but. Uh... <laughs> well, spell, so sorry. Are you done, Mike? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> no, I think, you know, for me, like, I think I'm going to go back. I'm pretty sure Jeff is going to agree with this. There's a lot of tools that we have at our hand now. We have a lot of data, a lot of technology, a lot of everything. But I think when you're comfortable, when you have a catcher that you can get along with, when uh, someone just gives you one or two keywords that really change something sometimes it may be just you know just the way you attack hitter is a first strike first pitch strike it's super simple things sometimes we're trying to make it so complicated how to get out the first thing is you got to stop missing bats you got to throw strikes and you got to make sure you attack the zone get ahead that's very simple and sometimes just a coach like that like to me my best Pitching coach, I had, he's never pitched in the big leagues. He was in uh, Dean Trainer, and he was a maniac. He was just like, you know, attack and attack. And when you're in doubt, keep attacking, understand fastball. And to me, that really fit into my personality. So I think it changes a little bit from, from uh, player to player. But I think the best coaches, like Jeff said earlier, it's you, know, you have the data, you have the technology, you have everything. But those best coaches, they understand what those keywords would be for certain guys. And it's not one size fits all. It's sometimes it might be a confidence thing. Sometimes it might be a pitch selection thing. Some other things, it could be mechanical, which rarely I think it's mechanical. But sometimes thinking you're making the mechanical changes, you know, changes some stuff on the mound. So to me, it's just it just all depends on the coaches. And what happened to him, I had him in A-ball in Arizona. And that guy, is, is, it was a stuff. He was unbelievable. He had two Tommy John, though. So he's always been supposedly amazing pitcher, but to get Chapman for it, it's pretty pretty good deal. Yeah. I, I think that's the big difference. But what do you think, Jeff? Yeah, I, I agree with what Eric's saying. I mean, you know, a pitching coach is there to give you the information. And sometimes you get on a team where they change the pitching coach and somehow you don't cl click with that pitching coach and all of a sudden you start tr struggling and you start looking looking for that way out and he's not one that can help you. So when a guy gets traded, sometimes that's the pitching coach that he goes to is the one that goes, Oh, I see this. You are just a tick off with something. Let's get it right back in. And all of a sudden the guy clicks and he's throwing the ball like he, he wanted to. I mean, I, there was a lot of people that didn't like Kerrigan in Montreal as far as a pitching coach, but in Montreal, you know, we had the low budget. We were always, you know, they're always, conservative but uh you know with him and duquette they kind of started analytical stuff in montreal um we had but it wasn't like spin rate it wasn't the stuff they have now it was about tendencies of other hitters you know we would go over stuff like uh you know this guy never swings the first pitch or if he does it's like once in a blue moon and it's probably with the guy on second base so that's the only time you got to worry about stuff like that we didn't have you know we were we were pretty analytical in Montreal, but it was basically to help a thought process for you on the mound. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, 
you know, teams, I got traded from, I was struggling in Seattle, went to Texas, and I finished up pitching pretty well there um, that year. We went to the playoffs. Was that and something you worked out on your own? Or was that the, the, the pitching coach there made the difference? No, it was a pitching coach. Um, pitching coach in Seattle, I won't say names, was pretty much absent all the time. Okay. You know, you go you go out, throw your bullpen, you, you know, he gives you time, and then he's not there, you know, and you're sitting around waiting for him. Um, then I got down there and I had a pretty good bullpen, pretty good coach, pitching coach down there. And then in uh, Chicago, I wasn't really struggling. I wasn't throwing great. I wasn't struggling. But uh, I got traded to St. Louis um, where I went to Duncan. And Duncan, you know, he's pretty much, as far as the mental game goes, is probably one of the best guys I'd ever been around. Um, and he also had his bullpen coach was a very good mechanical coach. So they both worked together and they talked to you about stuff. And it uh, worked out pretty well down there too. Well, so back in the I days, think, yeah. I mean, the 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. Was it Tony LaRusso that was head coach back then? LaRusso is the head coach there with St. Louis. Yeah. So him and Duncan were always together. Yeah. So, hey, go. I, think, I think I coached Kate. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Finish it, finish it, Jeff. Sorry. No, I, I, I really think a coach can't, that knows what's going on can do a lot mentally and physically for you. I mean, Duncan never was a pitcher. He was a catcher his big league career, but he understood what it took for a pitcher to get out there. And guys that threw to Duncan was a great catcher. And Eric was right on that time. Sometimes you don't feel capable of a catcher, and other times you have a catcher you have a great rapport with. You know, you opened the door, and now I have to go through it because, I mean, obviously I've been staring at your jersey ever since we started talking in the background. I can see the uh, – well, of course, man, you know. Is it always there? Was it just making an extra effort because, you know, the podcast is from Montreal. No, it's always there. It's always there? No, it's always there. That's, yeah, that's the rookie year jersey. Yeah. What's it like when you're, you know, somebody from the States and you hear your name, which is something you dream of all your life, but, you know, back in the 90s, you know, before Montreal became this big metropolis that, 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 you know, people talked about. Actually, no, Montreal was pretty popular in the 90s, but – you know, you get drafted, and then you go, what? Where? Was that your first reaction when you got drafted by, my, by Montreal? No, because, I mean, I wasn't originally drafted by Montreal. I signed with them as a six-year minor league free agent. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, I was drafted by the Cardinals originally. Okay. So I signed with them uh, after my six – uh, as a six-year minor league free agent. Yeah. Okay. Was it got a rule uh, five pick? No. Is that, is that is that what we used to call it? I was a rule five. I was rule five the year before by the White Sox. Okay. And then traded to Cleveland in spring training. Pitched one year there. Then I was a free agent after that, and uh, signed with the Expos and went to AAA Indianapolis for them. They called up and asked me if I'd share time as a closer and setup man for them in their bullpen. I said, sure. But uh, provisions they gave me said we'll call you to the big league big league camp whenever there was opportunities as needed so i got that opportunity what's your favorite moment as an expo or at least as you know playing for the expos and do you still do you believe do you believe in the comeback from the expos back to montreal <laughs> we ask everybody we're, we're hoping for that Come miracle on. answer <laughs> i love it he's he's gonna say I, that. I, yeah i would love to see him go back there i think the city was great i mean i you know, I look back at it and I go, you know, I was there when they were going through the uh, separatist part of the thing. So yeah. it was a little tough playing around there, listening to them, you know, even because some of them would bring it to the stadium and they were complaining about it. Not the players, the like yeah. uh, announcers and stuff like that. And, you know, we got to hear that. But as far as the city goes, I thought the city was great. I mean, I lived out on the West Island, so basically everybody was speaking English out there. But we always went into downtown for dinner or stayed in downtown after the games. Um, but uh, I love that city, and I uh, I think they should have the opportunity, if they're going to expand, be one of the teams that has a good look at, or even if they're going to move that Tampa team would be a good place to move them to. Well, no kidding. It would stay um, the American League East and uh, be relevant, but anyway. Yeah, and it, and you have that natural rivalry with Toronto for sure. Exactly. You know, yeah, Montreal-Toronto. Uh, I was just back in Montreal a couple of years ago too because our kids were young, so we took them back there for Christmas. 
and they really enjoyed it too. We took them to some of our old ha haunts. We got them in the Gibbies. Gibbies, um, of course. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's why I'm drawing a blank on the Italian place we went to all the time. Oh, but we took you. them there. Huh? Yeah, I was going to say, but that was a wrong, that was a wrong Italian place, I was going to say. <laughs> okay. it's, probably, it's probably closed by now. Uh, wait, Da Vin Da Vinci's? No, Da, da Vinci's, Vinci's, I think it was. Da Vinci's, yeah. da Vinci's? Yeah. where is it? I don't even know where it is, and I live here. Da Vinci's? It was, I don't know where it's at, it off, but used to serve all the time. It was close to Church Street or something like that. I don't know, right off. It was still there four years ago. Okay. I could ask, uh, the, I don't know, I sort of bring back those bad memories, but... Uh, <laughs> How crushing was the 94 strike? God damn it. <laughs> yeah, I, I love your reaction. It kind of sums it all up. Man. It was terrible. You know, I was, I, I've been watching the Braves Philly games the last couple of weeks, you know, and, or the last couple of days. And Smoltz has been talk, on there talking about it, you know, and they, they always talk about how the Braves won 14 divisions in a uh -uh, row. They, what, they didn't. 94 doesn't count. You didn't win 94. So it wasn't in a row. I know. That's but what bothers me. There should be an asterisk hey, beside it. Yeah. There should be. Um, very disappointing. I think, you know, you look back at it and I go, should we have waited until September 28th to go on strike instead of going when we did because of the teams that were hardliners, like Expos, White Sox, that are both in first place. I mean, we would have clinched by then and all of a sudden we're going to walk out on, on them. I don't think they would have, they would have done it. I think they would have negotiated and, had an agreement done within a day or two. What exactly happened? You, uh, you guys refresh my memories. I mean, because it was a weird time. Because whenever there'd be a strike or strike talk, it'd be during spring training or off season. But I mean, if what was it was early September, second week of September, or something it was like what twenty games left or something. Not even. Uh, no, it was in August. Was it August? Like August eighth. What was yeah, the it big? Was like August eighth. Was August eighth. It was that early. We missed two months. Really? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think. Uh, the talk was because of what happened in 81 where they, you know, they went out for two weeks and negotiated and got everything back that they thought we could do that. And we would still have basically the whole month of September to play. Um, but I mean, the owners played hard line ball with us and, you know, it, it ruined that season. It ruined Montreal. I personally, I think it killed Montreal franchise. Of course it did. Um, of course it did. Overall. But that money, we're signing two of the four guys. At least two of the of the four guys we left. We're keeping Walker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could have kept Walker, and who who left it? What was it? Walker. Gr Walker Grissom and Wetland. Oh, Wetland. Yeah, Wetland. Kenny yeah. Hill was the next year. Because the next year there was three more that were gone, and then the year after that. It was three more of us gone. It was me, Ro me, Lou, and somebody else. Rojas, maybe that year. Yeah. But you know what was amazing about that '94 team is like because Montreal, like you said, you know, small market, small market team. Uh, you know, w when it came down to the trade deadline, well, they did make some big moves during the trade deadline. It always didn't work out, but I mean, a lot of guys, you guys knew each other from from growing up together in the farm system. That's what was beautiful about it. There was like this, yeah. and because you're in Montreal and because you're, you're playing against, against those big city teams, the, these big budget teams, there seems to be this us against the world type of feeling. And, you know, the, I, I think, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, you guys were also maybe one of the youngest team in the league at yeah. the time. So I think I was the oldest guy on the team at 31. Wow. You know, so <laughs> every, everybody on that team was under, under 30, um, which... I mean, the, the talent that came off that team. I mean, we, you look what they dismantled in three years. And, yeah. You know, with the talent they had there. I mean, if we go on and win that World Series, I think they could have kept that team together for a couple, two or three more years, and who knows what would have happened. And, you know, aside from Walker, a lot of these guys didn't, you know, pan out. They'd play as well. You know, I know Wetland, Wetland was dominant with the Rangers for a while, but Grissom, a couple yeah. guys weren't the same. It was yeah. something different about getting, you know. Yeah. Gr Grissom did okay down in Atlanta for a while. Um, I think Alou did fine when he played in Houston and the Marlins. Uh, Rojas struggled when he left, but he had started getting arm problems. Uh, who else is there? I mean, yeah. you, look at, you look at our bullpen that year. You had a, you had Wetland as a closer. Yeah. Shaw left with LA as a closer. Yeah. Rojas became the closer in Montreal, then 
signed with the Cubs. Um, Tim Scott could have been a closer. Tim I mean, Scott, do great flashback. That, that team, that team would have been. I mean, the team was dominant. I mean, even if we went seven innings, we didn't even have to go seven innings half the time if we didn't want to, or eight innings, because once we got to those three guys at the end of the game, it was. <laughs> Is it the best over. team you played on? Is it the best team you've ever played on? You think? Complete team, yes, probably. Yeah, the most talented team. team probably at the time would have been field wise, probably Seattle. When you had, we had, uh, you know, you had Buner, Griffey, Martinez, A Rod, Joey Cora, you know, good. but good. Up, and, up and down the line as far as the pitching, pitching staff and the, uh, Position players is probably the best team I ever played on. Yeah, I would have given everything just to be like, you know, it's one thing to watch a player from the stands like I like can Griffey Jr., but to be beside him and watch him on an everyday basis just make it look so effortless and so natural and with that big grin. I mean, he was a po he was a perfect poster boy for baseball. Yeah, he was. But I would say that, you know, I wouldn't throw Larry Walker too far behind him as far as everything that he could do. I mean... He could run, he could throw, he could do, and he could hit for power and hit for average. So, I mean, I was really glad to see that he got into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, deserved it. I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. I'm going to go in a different direction, and and, and Gags will uh, probably follow. I was going to go in a totally different direction, but you go for it, buddy. Okay, no, well, 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 go, on, <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I don't, fine, no, go ahead. No, no, I want to see where you're going. Uh, I can't go. No, I was just going to ask you, like, we talk about all the big teams. Like, we talked about the Rangers earlier that now at the trade deadline, they traded over, you know, they traded a lot of guys away. That didn't really pan out so far. Yeah. But you know, if you're if you're the angel, it's okay. Whoever made those moves this year, that was gonna say, man, you know, <sighs> you, nobody's gonna look as bad as the angels. You could fuck That's up everything was, um, you want. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder, like, because I'm I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of the GM over there. He was with the Rangers when I was there, and I can I can't imagine trading Otani. But what would you have done if you're the GM for the Angels? What do you do? Because you got Trout there, you got Otani. I mean, of course, you're you. I, I think they're, they're like, both leaving. Game. They're both leaving. I'm. I'm, I'm I, I wonder, but what would you have done? Looking back now, of course, it's easy well, looking back. But what would you have done with Otani and Trout and all these guys at the same time? What do you and what do you do now? I think, I mean. I look at Otani. I think they knew that he had a bad elbow and they weren't, he wasn't going to pass some kind of test mm -hmm. if he got traded or so. I think that's why they pulled him off the market there. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do. I know I was reading some stuff about Philadelphia really wants to bring trout in to well, Philly yeah. because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to go there. Is what he's saying, but so what he's saying really he's a New Jersey boy. He's an Eagles yeah. fan. Of course he's going to go there. I know that's what I, that's what I keep thinking too. He'll go there. I don't. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with Otani, because I mean, he definitely can't pitch next year because he'll have to have Tommy John surgery. Yeah. He will be able to hit because I was talking to some doctors here. I went to Louisville and was talking to a couple of doctors about him, and they said since it's his right arm, he hits left-handed, that'll have no effect on his swing. Yeah, just like Harper. Um, yeah, so he'll be able to, he'll be able to hit. So is the team going to just sign him? Are they going to pay him big money to be the DH and not pitch? Or are they going to just sign him as a DH and never yeah, know now, if he's going to pitch again? And how do you structure that contract? You know what I mean? Like you go, okay, he's worth as a hitter. I don't know. He's worth, uh, let's say, anywhere from 25 to $35 million almost now. I mean, and you don't, you know, he's not probably not going to pitch next year. So how do you formulate as a first yeah, of all, he's as an agent, you after that, I mean, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be, just I get it. But as off. an agent, as an agent, you go one year deal maybe and wait till he's healthy and then go for the big contract. Or what do you do? I mean, it almost gives him more he, options, you know? Yeah. You might have to wait two years. You might have to wait and see, yeah. Yeah. try and sign him for two years, let him pitch one year and then go from there. Yeah. Because teams, I don't know if teams will still take a chance after one full year of, the, of pitching. Yeah, but he's gonna. You never know about Tom. Is he gonna accept that? You know what I'm thinking? I'm going off. I'm, I'm just going to go off on a bin here. I don't, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Otani and Trout, we seem to be very close, uh, very close. Don't make some kind of a deal of like, hey, how about we go to the same place together and just win it? Let's get let's get that ring, let's get that chip off our shoulder, and let's just do it. You know, we've seen in the NBA, we've never seen in any, any other sport, but why not? The guys love each other, the guys are tight, the guys can make a difference on the ball club. 
you know. But why can't the Angels figure it out? You know, yeah. it's not like they're in desolate. They're 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 in Los Angeles, and there's money there. There's a lot of money there still, even for the Angels. But for some reason, they can't figure it out. And I, you know, I don't know if it's the guys they're bringing in the clubhouse. You know, if there's some problems inside the clubhouse that kind of festers around there. But I mean. It's all these when bad, it's all these bad contracts. I mean, Rondon, uh, well, Pujols, before that, Hamilton. Guys, yeah, but these guys are good players. I mean, we keep talking about bad contracts, but these guys, I mean, you're never going to see players like this on a team. I mean, you look at Rondon, you go Otani, and you got Trout in the same team, and you can't find, like, we're, we talk about it a little bit, like, that's when pitching comes into play. You can't, you can buy hitters. Yeah. It doesn't matter, but you can't get pitching, and that's been the problem with the Angels. They have no farm there's nothing down there to pitch. I mean, it's been years and years and years. They keep trying to buy pitching, and that's where I like, go back to. You coach a long time in the minor leagues, and you know yeah. we go back to old school and a new school and everything else. You got to be able to get some guys to you know to learn how to pitch, and I think that's what's lacking. And that the Angels' problem is the same way. You've been part of a lot of organizations. Like what, what's what makes a good organization? What makes a good minor league? You know, minor league pitching staff, and how do you grow that? Because you've been part of that, and how what does makes a difference? Because they got to figure it out. You have to, you have to develop pitching in your own organization. You can't wait. I mean, you know, you look at the pitchers they go out and sign. They've been playing for six, seven years, and you're signing them to a seven more year deal. They're not, they're not going to last. You know, not, not, not in the game nowadays. The way they pitch. I mean, you get a guy, you're going to sign, 150 million dollars a year for five years, and he's already pitched 10 years in the big leagues. You know, you you might get two good years out of him, and you got three years. What are you going to do with him? Mm -hmm. You know, as far as a starter goes, because of all, and if it's somebody that throws really hard, you know that they're they're not going to last. You know, as long the training they're doing now, all they do so. is max effort. So do you, so would you agree? Remember the CBA this year? They're arguing about getting a young studs like that getting paid earlier in their career. Would that be good for you? I think that's what they need to focus on. That's what the players need to focus on. Yeah. Find a way to get paid earlier in your career, almost like the NBA style, or whatever, because it's, you know, guys yeah. that you do sign five, six, seven year deal, but that's after 11 years under control. You have five, six years in the minor you league know, and six years in major leagues. If you look, if you look at baseball, even over the hundred years, guys, prime time, prime, prime playing years are basically 28 to 32. Mm-hmm. That's a Anything small window. Yeah, it's a small window for your prime where you, you should know it as much as you can learn playing the game and as well as you can play it. And then, you know, your body just starts wearing out after you're 32 years old. If, I mean, you get drafted, you're 20 years old, you know, you develop, your body develops more, and you get like four, four good years of where your body should be perfect for you. And then... After that, it's going to start going downhill. And if you have a left arm, you can last a little longer than a right-hander. And on top of that, you add that the, the the average career is three and a half years. Of course, lefties is different. Dude, you guys are all messed up anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, That's lefty. I said. It's not worth anything. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a left arm, you can last longer. <laughs> yep. No, it's amazing. I mean, that's what I can, that's why I can't wait till what they're doing, what they're going to do with this, because it's a, you know, you don't make any money in the minor leagues that you've seen, and then at least a little bit. And I mean, they've made some changes. They've cut some players, of course. They brought the salary a little higher in the minor leagues. But what do you think of those changes? Do you think they need to do more? Do you think Manfred and all these guys they care at all about their assets in the minor leagues? Is it is there yeah. what, what other changes they need to do in the minor leagues? For that? Well, before you answer, Jeff, I was going to say I'm I'm. I, I can't. I, I don't understand why the 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 MLBPA hasn't gotten involved with making sure that the quality of life didn't get better in my leagues for the longest time. And of course, they they increased the you know the the, the wages or whatever. They cut down like you know twenty percent of the far teams, and they've they've cut the draft by more than half. So I'm one to say that you know I mean I think twenty is not that many rounds. Uh, Eric disagrees with me. What do you think? Um. Well. You know, they cut all these teams down, but all it's done is fed the independents. Yep. So now all, all the teams are out scouting independent teams. And, you know, they're just looking for guys that, you know, that they're looking at the 21 through 50 rounds that they don't have a draft for. And that's what they're looking to fill rosters with right now. Because I think, I mean, when I came up, there wasn't a whole lot of minor league teams. I mean, you had 
you had your short season team, you had two A ball teams, you had double A and triple A, so five. So they're basically back to where it was back in the early 80s and stuff. So I know that they're paying them better. I know that they're paying for their housing too, which helps. Yeah. But it's, you know, the thing about it is if you give them so much, do they get comfortable in the minor leagues and not develop? Where when you're not getting that stuff and you're hungry and you know what you can get when you get to the top, that you fight harder to get there. I love it. I so, mean, it's, it's, still a, uh, it's still a weeding out process. Fuel yeah, the I mean, fire with peanut butter and jelly up. sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, just deprivation. <laughs> deprivation. Deprive them of things that they want more, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think but and another thing that would, the MLB needs to consider, too, is the NILs. When the NIL is starting to come in, the guys are not going to go out there in the minor leagues pay, you know, get $9,000 or over making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 if it's done right because that's going to change a lot. And I can't wait to see how – how that's going to affect it. And what do you think? Cause like we talked about independent league, I mean, colleges now it's going to change a little bit. If I'm a team, I'm starting to draft a lot older. I'm starting to get like, you know, I'm getting those guys. That the college the older kids. Guys. Exactly. I would. And what do you think Jeff? On yeah. that? Does it think that's going to affect a lot? Yeah. No, I think that I think getting an older guys, I mean, they should develop faster. I mean, you're going to pay, I mean, the high school kids not going to have the NIL yet. So you can kid him, but, I think the older kids out of college would be, you know, as far as the development and get them to the big leagues is going to be a lot faster than the high school kids. But like you said, the NIL, who knows, like if these guys are going to sign contracts <clears throat> or what they're going to sign, they're going to go, well, I made this. I need to be yeah. making this up there. It's, it's going to be when it all circulates all the way through everything, it'll be interesting to see. I don't know how much a baseball player gets in an NIL. I think, yeah, I mean, you know what the football players make a ton of money. I don't know what the other branded sports are going to make. No, I mean, I'm much. sure there's some, yeah, there's one or two guys, three guys maybe on a baseball team because you're just not on TV. I mean, yeah. very really. I mean, if you're Big Ten, SEC, you know, if you have your own network, yeah, they're on for baseball, but how many people sit there and watch a college baseball game? Exactly. I mean, you know, you can't compare that to, like, prime time Saturday night or Saturday afternoon playing, you know, like we saw this weekend yeah. between Texas and Bama, you know, so nothing can – you can't reproduce that in baseball. Jeff, time is flying by before we let you go. You know, yeah, I'm sure – it's one of those suck questions where, like, you know, you could have 10,000 different answers, but, I mean, what is that one or one of them – uh, expo uh, memory memories from uh, from uh, playing here in Montreal, playing for the Expos. What's the memories? Yeah, you want the one moment that stands out. You want the one that sucks the most? This is the one I lost the no hitter on the line drive back at me. That's the one that sucks the most <laughs> from my memory. Was it really a line drive? I'm sorry, anyone to bring back line drive that you thought it was it, a line drive? It was a soft line. It was a change up hit back at me. I reacted too quick. <laughs> That's the one that sucked for me. Uh, the best moment probably was getting to watch Dennis Martinez throw his perfect game. Yeah, El you Presidente. Know, you don't get to see him that often. And being in, well, I was watching it from the bullpen in LA, but it was still, you're sitting there watching, and you keep going, you keep looking up there. There's no hits, there's no hits. And, you know, and the phone's not ringing in the bullpen either. So you're sitting there and you're watching them all the way through the game. But yeah. that was probably one of the best moments up there, too. And, you know, it's always the, probably for every player that actually makes it, your greatest moments getting called up. Yeah. Do you remember that day? Do you remember exactly what happened? Where were you when I hit? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I was in, we were in Indianapolis, and uh, <laughs> that's a good story. Uh, I went out and played golf that morning with a football player for the Colts. And another guy on our team, and uh, my wife always had lunch ready. <laughs> well, the round took a little longer than we thought, so I stopped at the house, told her I was going to eat, and we're going to go to the game, and uh, I had to get to the park. So I, after the game, they called me in the office, tell me I'm going up, you know, because I, I didn't pitch that night, and there was an opportunity for me to close. So I went, you know, I go, I go out. You know, I'm looking for her. She, she didn't come to the game at all. She was mad. Really? So I go home and told her. Yeah, she was mad. I go, I go home. I get home and I tell her. 
that uh, I got good news and bad news. She goes, what's the good news? The good news is I'm going to Montreal. <laughs> bad news is you didn't come to the game today. <laughs> yeah, but, but I'm also I'm leaving in about four hours to catch the flight. Not it was that like, quick. Yeah. You know, I had to pack quick. But, you know, that was, I mean, that was the day I went to, the first time I, <clears throat> I was up there for two weeks, got sent back down for 10 days. And after that, I never saw another day in the minor leagues oh, for 16 man. years. That's amazing. Well, 16 yeah, years, so. man. 16. Hey, thanks so yeah. much, uh, Jeff. And uh, yeah. well, I know for you guys, it's just like a matter of like, I'll see you tomorrow. I guess you guys are golfing. <laughs> and, and, how, far, how far apart do you guys live from each other? Like four streets or something? Or just uh, Maybe. Uh, about four miles. Four miles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's right there. Seven, Maybe about four yeah, miles. It's, it's a seven, eight-minute bike ride, so it's close. Yeah, Mr. Bike. Yeah. Here. Everything's doing everything's good. <laughs> by hey, thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing all these You're memories. Welcome. And, uh, man, thanks, hopefully Jeff. we'll talk soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Okay, man. thanks, Max. See you, Eric. Take care. See you, buddy. All right, it's time for the uh, last segment, which is a new segment. So I don't know if we made the actual uh, – did we update the, the, the panel or uh, Simo, Sai? Would go? Ah, here we go. This oh. is uh, yeah. Now we're like um, we, uh, this is a new sponsor we have for the uh, well for La Poche Bleu and also for uh, Game Over. Uh, you can see sports interactions. Uh, you know it, it's a gambling site. Play reasonably is what I always say, and uh, and I really mean it. I mean just you know make sure it is for fun, and that you're not shaking every night thinking you know if you're gonna pay your mortgage or whatever. Um, so uh, basically, uh, just to honor the new uh, the new sponsorship, uh, let's go with the production. Let's go, let's go to an easy one. We're uh, right now, like I said, you know, we're September fourteenth. Um, things are going pretty wild, and uh, I mean, you know, a couple of leagues. It's pretty clear in the uh, National League uh, West and East. Central still up for grabs. Um, American League Central. I don't know. I mean, nobody's going to catch the Twins. So uh, I was I, I was going to take the Rangers out of the game, but I mean, with those uh, that three game winning streak against the Blue Jays, that's why I'm wearing the, the jersey mm -hmm. in honor of the. Uh, Sugar Daddy, that uh, that cock blocked me from going to uh, to the uh, to the baseball game, and uh, <laughs> this is uh, this is, the, uh, is, 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 that, is that does that mean we're a different baseball podcast when the expression cock block just you know sprung up and stuff? But uh, according to the odds, according to uh, Sports Interaction, uh, they got Houston at one point four six to win the division. They got Seattle at four point twenty five and Texas at five point seven or five point three. Sorry, I wrote uh, too quickly. Uh, <laughs> What predictions you made? You think it's going to change? Or uh, as far as I'm concerned, I know it'd be a sucky no, safe bet, I, but I don't see anybody displacing Houston. I, yeah, I don't either. I think Houston's pretty much, you know, they've been there, they've done that. Rangers, I was hoping that, that was my call earlier that I thought the Rangers were going to win the division, but you know, they, you said that weeks off, ago, but uh, yeah, I don't know, I know, and I was wrong, obviously, because I'm taking the Astros now. So I think the Astros are going to stay on top. I mean, they've been there, they know how to win. For some reason, they figure out a way, and I think the Rangers are a better team. But hey, winning is not just about you know the best players. We talked yeah. about about how much money you spend. It's about how you know the process of winning. And I think the Houston Astros know how to do so. I think the Houston Astros over. You know, I'm, I'm always fun of teams like Seattle. I mean, we talked about them with Jeff. You know, I mean, the, you know, well-rounded team. You know, uh, good starting staff. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. great bullpen. Even though they traded away uh, Seawald, which was a surprise to everybody. Uh, you know they knew they had the young arms to to make up for the loss. Um, you know Julio Rodriguez. Who, who, how can you not love that guy, man? He's just a monster, and 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 you know the best is yet to come. You know so. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I'm 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 still bitter about the fact that they traded away Toro. I don't know. I'm, this is for Toro. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we, don't, exactly. we don't like people messing with our boys. <laughs> exactly. Don't mess up with him. Don't mess with the boys. And just uh, uh, but then I can say the same thing about Houston. I don't know. It just it just. It bugs me. You know what? I was never a huge Houston hater. You know, I mean, I don't know how much it was. You know, I'd like to know the whole story about the whole cheating scandal. You probably know more than I do. You know, like the whole thing when Altuve didn't want to open his uh, his his, uh, his, uh, his his jersey and stuff, and jersey, just. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But again, you know, who's not really taking, trying to cheat? How much of a difference a did it make? So last that's year, was that? <laughs> that's a little different, but hey. That's for another day. We'll talk about that another another podcast. Oh, that's still sore. That Dodger loss was still sore to you, right? Is that what it is? Am I, no, am I, am I, am I, I just, just like poking? Yeah, I don't, we am don't I even poking the bear. Really cheated, cheated. So anyway. <laughs> but the point no, is, I just think yeah. it's, but you know, I would love to see. Like, I've, I've never been like a big. 
To me, the Texas Rangers are like this soulless team, you know? I mean, I know there's huge fan base and stuff. I, I don't mind them. You know, to me, like the Texas Rangers, like if you have a party and somebody shows up, just like, huh, okay. You know what I mean? It's like, is it okay if my cousin comes? Yeah, whatever. You know, like the Rangers are somebody's cousin who shows up at a party. That's the way I see it, anyway. But point is, like, I, I, wish, I wish they were more sexy. Um, you know, their legacy is pretty much what... I mean, you know, except for Nolan Ryan, it's probably and it's still pretty much the biggest highlight uh, of the franchise's story. I love the team dish. I love, you know, I I, I don't think the Jays were. I've been the same since Seaman, uh, Seaman uh, left the team. Um, you know what, how, what? can you say about about uh, Corey? Um, geez, well, oops, I got a blank. Seager. Corey Seager. Thank you, Corey Seager. Uh, you know, I love. I, I roll this. Uh, well, like they got great players. Yeah, Na just, Nathan Lowe. I love. You know, I mean. Yeah, you can and name I, all of them. They're great. But then you put it together, it's a whole package. And how do they perform together? It is a process. And how do you do this? And, you know, it takes time to understand how to win. And I think they, they're learning that money yeah. is not the end-all be-all, obviously. But they haven't been the same since Jung got hurt. And I don't understand why, because I mean, he was having a great season. He probably would have won Rookie of the Year if it wasn't for that injury. He was, he was, you know, he would have been, at worst, he would have finished second behind Henderson. But I think, I think he was having better stats and better season than Henderson was. Yeah, moving yeah. one piece out, it moves everybody else, and it's, it just makes a big difference. You know? Really does it? I don't, Little detail, yeah. of course. And of course, you get different pitches in different spots, and it just changes the whole, you know, it just changes the whole dynamic of your lineup. And, you know, people don't really, we talked about Jeff Kent when he was hitting behind Bonds. I mean, he was getting probably more in front of Bonds. They're getting a lot more fastballs. So that's the, yeah. that's how it works. And, that's the beauty of that. Hmm. Quick question, because like I said, I'm going to repeat the date. You know, today's September 14th, uh, which is why, you know, the odds that I mentioned are as of today, just to make sure, you know, before we get sued or something. <laughs> but just, uh, <laughs> uh, we got uh, two more episodes. We got, we got one more episode in English left, which is uh, will be on in two weeks. Two weeks from now, when you and I talk, are the Blue Jays in or out of the playoffs? Uh, I think they're in the playoffs. I think the Rangers are going to keep sliding. I think with the Scherzer injury and everything else, they're going to keep sliding. Maybe not slide, but I think the Blue Jays are going to get a little bit of revival, hopefully. I'd just love to see them as a walk card. That'd be amazing. It'd be amazing. And you know what, my prediction? Because I was supposed to go see up. the Rangers play the Jays. Like I said, you know, Mr. Sugar Daddy fucked it up for me. But then I, I, I went, uh, I saw the Jays in the playoffs, which was like five or six years ago. Six or seven years, time flies. And it was against the Rangers. I was there for the famous Batista bat flip. Yep. And yeah. uh, you know what? If they, if they, if they, uh, to, as far as I'm concerned, here's my prediction: Seattle's going to be out for some reason. The two wild card teams, because the Rays are way ahead. Uh, Rays are pretty. They haven't clinched, but they're pretty safe. It's going to be the, the, the Blue Jays and the Rangers. And if that happens, mm -hmm. I'm going to the game. And you're coming. Well, coming you, with you, me. And you know what they should have? You should have Rugi Hodo Odor throw the first pitch to Batista. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be classic. You know what? You know what's so amazing? Because I mean, they're trying to make the more the game more real, more accessible. You know, like actually on, on the September twentieth, they get like a virtual visit of a of the stadium of a game or whatever. I haven't read all the details. It's like you can watch the game in three D and on your screen and blah, blah blah. You know where else you can watch the game on three D? At the stadium. How about we try? You know, can we just give this like you know? I mean, I'm not being this old guy on a balcony just like rocking a shirt going, dude, back in my days, this is what... No, but I mean, just just go to the game, man, and just stuff. But uh, if if let, let's make a deal. If the Jays and, and play the Rangers in the playoffs, uh, you come up and see the game with me. You can be my sugar daddy. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> that way I know good, I man. won't get fucked up. <laughs> we'll ask Russell for tickets. <laughs> exactly. Of course, man. Hey, folks, thanks for being here. If you want to follow us on social media, here's uh, all the addresses that obviously uh, you can, uh, you know, punch up and stuff. Thanks for La Poche Bleu for, uh, you know, co-producing the show with us. And just, uh, man, what a blast. Uh, first season is almost over. Uh, we'll see where we go from there. We'll keep you up to date as to, like, you know, what we do during the off season. But uh, thanks for being with us. And, man, Jeff, what? He's a quiet guy. Is, is, is he more? Is he like that when he golfs? He's got he's got a he's got Actually, a perfect golf uh, t temper. Oh yeah, he's very excited today. By the way, <laughs> really? That was a, that was excited Jeff right there. That was a guy that just super super. I upset. wish you would have told me that before we started. <laughs> you should have told me that. No, oh, we're God. so bad when we talk. Like our wife tells us because our wives are in business together, do real estate. And uh, they kind of like, they, this, that's the thing. When me and Jeff get together, it was like four words. You got to, you know, we're over, we're all about quality over quantity. Yeah, because you're pretty quiet too. Like, not really a podcast. But oh, I mean, yeah. uh, if you would have told me that before, I, I, I would have waited for just one answer. He goes, all right, Jeff, calm down. <laughs> Don't get carried away. Come on. Just like, you know, 
You got to give me that information. Yeah, he's, a, he's a good guy. Quality over quantity, that's for sure. I love it, and I agree with you. Hey, thanks for being here, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care, guys. And this is game over. <laughs> Well, Sorry, I was messing with my computer. I know, I know, I know. We're never going to get it. That's the charm. Actually, you know what? The date, the date's going to be well synchronized and like just said perfectly. It'll be oh, over. It'll just suck. We are done. All right, Thank guys. You. Thank you. Take care, Thanks, buddy. Game over!